Uh, how can sports pedagogy in any way contribute, or in any way contribute anything to sort of real, what I would call real pedagogy, that is the art of teaching, or as a lot of people want, the science of teaching, pedagogy. Uh, I would contend, in fact, that it's really the other way around. It's not that pedagogy has anything to offer athletics or sports or the science of teaching sports. Uh, I wouldn't call it a science, I would call it an art. Uh, I really think it's the other way around. Take a look at the picture up here. Uh, and imagine that you're standing up there on the last hole at the black course at Beth Page out on Long Island, the US Open, a couple thousand people sitting around there. You've got three of the best players playing with you. You've got an international telev television audience watching you. And you've got to hit that little ball with this little club, with a little face of that club. And one millimeter will make a difference. Will make a difference. One millimeter to the left is going to send the ball flying off in the wrong direction. Two millimeters to the left, you are flying up into the stands on the right-hand side. That's it, you lose. Down the drain, six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars. One little shot, one little set, a centimeter or two millimeters. Are we ever in that position as Latinists where our ability to form a phrase and get it out grammatically and syntactically correct and idiomatically correct? We're just never in the position where it's gonna cost us that, that much money. For some of us, it might cost us our job or a potential job. Uh, I, gave my job I gave a job talk in Latin. And I guess in that respect, there was some sort of pressure on me not to goof up. Uh, but it's nothing like what athletes face. And this is where athletics has created an, this sort of ultimate atmosphere or environment to test pedagogy, to see which theories, which practices really do work. Uh, and I will add sort of one caveat, which I call cherry picking. Uh, in sort of every teaching profession, whether it's sports or theater or uh, Latin, there are always some people in some schools that are able to attract the very best students. Let's say you teach in one of these test schools, and your test school is the most popular test school in the whole area. And you've got a line of 600 students to choose from. So you're going to get the best students to start with. And that throws things off a little bit. Uh, the ideal is, to, is for everybody to start with, the, with students who are of the exact same level. But that's impossible. Students, each, student bring, each student brings something different to the classroom. More experience, parents who are academics, siblings who have studied Latin. Uh, and then it's tough to judge exactly how effective your teaching, your teaching methods are. Are the kids making a lot of progress because they've got a Latin professor at home? Or they've got a brother or sister who have had Latin and they help them every day? Or is it really what you're doing in class? Or, I think more importantly, uh, it's, what the, it's what the students feel how they feel about Latin. Pedagogy people call it affect, but it really comes down to this. Do they really want to be there? Do they really want to study Latin? Are they motivated to study Latin? Uh, and it's this motivation side that seems to me to be all wrong in the classroom. And it's not our fault. We're put into a system. The system is built up, and we're told to teach in that system. Uh, so I've played just about any sport you can imagine uh, and went through all sorts of horrible coaches. Gr so a couple great coaches, but well, you know, I shouldn't say that on camera. Uh, I won't say which coaches were good and which coaches were bad. Uh, but there are some who were good and some who were bad. But one thing that was universal in 25 years of competitive athletics, I 
almost never saw a teammate not do what the coach said, not do it enthusiastically, not do it full blast, even if we were having a horrible season, even if, you know, out of 15 games, we had only won one. At practice, if the coach said, run three miles, well, we ran three miles. The coach said, one morning our coach, we had a coach had us wake up before, I mean, this was in college, so at six o'clock in the morning we had to get up, and he had a new idea. We were going to be judged on how far we could run in six minutes. Six minutes. How far can you run? Do you know what that means? That means you've got to figure out a pace that you can hold, a sort of maximum pace, for six minutes. Uh, and it was really amazing to see how far we could get in six minutes. Now, as a Latin teacher, I teach, I teach elementary students and grad students at UMass Boston. Uh, sometimes I'm amazed at how difficult it is to motivate college students, and I imagine you high school teachers experience this, <laughs> how difficult it is to motivate the students to do what I tell them to do. Uh, and I think it has to do with the dynamics in the atmosphere that we've created. There's, we lack, we lack public performance. We lack that forum where our students are going to go out and com maybe compete against, it doesn't have to be open competition like in sports, but maybe it, ca it also can be in a good way. Uh, we lack that forum where the students are exposed. Our teaching methods are via the students exposed. If year after year after year, your students come in last place, well, either you should start rethinking how you're teaching or you should find another profession. Uh, and the students face the same issue. If they go out, if they go out there and whatever the Latin equivalent of not being able to dribble with your left hand is, if they can't do that, they're at a huge disadvantage. And the other kids are going to beat them. The other kids are going to run by them and score points. That's a big motivation for the kids to go home and work on their left hand, start dribbling the ball left-handed, cover their eyes up. How long can they dribble the ball? The same, I mean, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about golf or basketball or anything else. It's this public exposure. It's the performance aspect which finally sets the whole motivation paradigm or motivation continuum into alignment. And if you can figure out a way to get your kids to look at you in the same way that athletes look at their coaches, things are going to get a lot easier. They're going to do what you tell them to do, and some of them are going to do it 10 times over. There'll be competition among your own students to see who can do it best. Because they both, they really want to enjoy this. Kids love to compete. Adults love to compete. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about golf and give you some specifics about this. Let's move down. This is what I look like when I'm playing. I usually end up in the rough someplace out there. Uh, but I'm not alone. I've got, a t I've, got a, I've got a friend out there. And it doesn't have to be some big formal competition with hundred of, hundreds of golfers and thousands of people in the audience. In fact, most golf is played by people like me, people like you, who play on the weekends or whenever they get a chance. How many of us look at Latin in that way? Oh, oh, it's Saturday. Got to do four hours of Latin today. <laughs> well, there are a lot of people who, when they finish work on Friday, what they start thinking about is, do I have enough time to get to the driving range? And when they get to the driving range, many of them now, in particular, because elite sports has really improved the, improved the, sort of the methods or the rationale or how you organize a practice session. There's come sort of new waves of self-teaching. That is, how do I organize my half an hour of practice to get the most out of it? Because as an amateur, I'm just going to show up at the driving range and hit balls. Is that going to be effective? I just show up at the driving range, bang. Oh, that looked good. And I just hit 50 balls. Use all my clubs, walk away. Does that seem like an efficient use of my time? I don't think so. I think it would be better for me to analyze how I play the game. 
what I'm out playing. That is, every performance gets analyzed. This is where the digital world has profoundly changed coaching, profoundly uh, changed athletics. Before it used to be like this, the black art or the secret art. If you were lucky to get one of these coaches who had a superior knowledge of the game, he could open up a door to all sorts of secret techniques. Techniques that he got from his coach. Techniques that he developed when he was an All-American in college. And you go there and he tells you, okay, when you're gonna shoot, just move your shoulder a little to the right and follow through up there. Or if he's a golf coach, he'll say, uh, he'll put a board behind your, right behind your ball, a board, a little thin piece of wood. He'll say, all right, Jim, hit the ball. You stand there and you take a swing and you try to hit it and the board shatters. It's a little humiliating. He puts another board down, hit the ball again. Well, eventually you start to be able to hit the ball with a little tiny space between the ball and the piece of wood. And this is called using lag in golf. It means simply that your hand should be in front of the ball when you strike the ball. And that's what makes the ball leap up into the air. It's counterintuitive. Who would think that having your hands in front of the ball would send it leaping up into the air, just like these professional shots. They're so beautiful. Fly up there and land on the green and back up. This is what it used to be. Uh, the digital world has changed this. If you're a basketball player, maybe John is into hoops, little tall guy. Yeah, he does. He has trouble jumping. I'd have trouble yeah, jumping. Yeah, yeah. As a 12-year-old, I decided I was going to be a professional basketball player. And that meant I spent all my week, whole weekends, whole day Saturday, Sunday, at the YMCA playing basketball. I loved it. It was great. Uh, and I was going to be a professional. Uh, what I didn't get was I got a lot of good play there, but it turned out to be conflict with my coach in school who wanted to play in a different way. So basketball never happened. But I didn't have, what I didn't have, what the kids have today, is the internet. So here we have Kobe Bryant right here sitting with us. Now Kobe is an awesome player. He's got all sorts of cool techniques. So as a 12 year old, I would have sat in front of my computer. Rewind, yes, rewind, yes, until I imprinted everything that Kobe does when he does this awesome crossover and goes lefty and then comes back to his righty and puts it up. I could have gotten all of that because, I, because the internet has replaced these coaches. All the secrets are out there. You want to know, uh, when I played basketball in the 80s in high school, yeah, I'm that old, uh, dribbling was really not that advanced. The only people who really dribbled well were elite college players, some professional, bas professional basketball players, of course. But now you have eighth graders who dribble like professional basketball players used to dribble in the 80s. These little kids can go lefty, righty, between their legs, behind their back. It's insane to see them dribble. And if you told somebody 30 years ago that not just one 12-year-old, or 13 year old, but lots of them, one or two on every team would be able to do this. There's no way they would have believed you. No way. So what are we as Latinists waiting for? You look at this, ask yourself this question. Really simply put, we're Latin teachers, all of us. How much Latin do we really know compared to a golf pro? Not, this isn't the golf pro who plays in the tournament. This is a golf pro who teaches at the driving range down the street, part-time. I would bet they know a hell of a lot more about golf than we know about life. I include myself in this group. And not only that, but they can perform. Where for us, performance is terrifying. It's something we, we watch performance. We observe it in written form. We don't oftentimes do it. Some of us jumped in to the active Latin movement a long time ago. But we had to go through the same thing that people who are starting now. That is, how do you go from a passive knowledge to an active knowledge? Well, it's right there. You've got to go to the driving range. It's not enough just to speak. It's not enough. Speaking is more the performance. Speaking is being out on the golf course and hitting the ball. But Latinists, we have no tradition in our profession 
for practice in the way that athletes have, the way that athletes take it for granted. As I'm saying this, of course, this is changing. There are a couple people in here who work with this very issue, that is, improving the means or coming up with methods that not so much you use to teach your students, but you use to teach yourself. And I think this is in the same belief that I have, that the more you know, the more you can do, the more you can perform, the better teacher you can be. You can be a better teacher. You have more to offer your students. And that there should be a focus, I would say almost the primary focus, on ourselves, on developing our own talents. Uh, and athletes, if we, look at, if we look at elite athletes, they have really developed this self-teaching, the self-teaching method how to organize practice, how to analyze your performance, and then to use that to decide what you need to work on. Maybe fit the clension, maybe cum clauses, maybe conditionals, maybe you have problems putting idioms together, maybe you have a speed issue. That is, speaking Latin is a lot like riding a bike. Does anybody know what steering speed is or steering velocity? How easy is it to ride a bike going really slow, to learn to ride a bike and go really slow? It's really, really difficult. But most of us learn to ride a bike by going slow, which is much more difficult than going fast. It's the velocity that makes it easy to steer a bike. Same thing goes for uh, snowboarding. I started snowboarding when I was 40. Lots of people fell, or they fall for the first year. The problem is they go too slow. They put them on the kitty hill, and they fall, and they fall. You gotta go on a big hill. But then there's the issue of, can you stop? Up here, up here we have Roy, Roy McIlroy, one of the, the best golfer in the world last year for a couple weeks, or a little, a couple months. He's awesome. Roy's a little guy. Well, here, relatively speaking, short guy. But Roy hits like a big man. Roy pounds the ball. He's one of the long hitters on the turn, out on the tour. What the heck does weightlifting especially this sort of power weightlifting, doing squats with 350 pounds, what does that have to do with a finesse sport like hitting golf? This is called non-sport specific training. Right? And the people who say, well, I need, I'm only worried about reading. How many times have you heard that? I just want to read really well, so I should read. How many graduate students fell for the nonsense called German for reading knowledge? <laughs> How many of you can speak German right now? How many of you can read scholarly text in German right now? Well, we got one. <laughs> Most people can't. That is, because you learn it in such a passive way, it decays. It decays. Uh, that's because they didn't understand the non-sport specific aspect of working out. That is, if you want to read really well, you've got to find something which is a lot more difficult than reading to do. You've got to build up your core reading muscles. And for the English, for people who are native English speakers, that means you have to learn to comprehend Latin word order in the order it naturally occurs in. If you have ever told your students to find the verb, find the subject, there is no way they're going to learn to read. They might learn to puzzle it together, and after doing that 16 times, maybe they might approach some sort of knowledge reading. But to learn to read Latin, you need to learn to handle these phrases in clauses in the order they come. You need to learn to pick up the clues as you go and process, like going to a movie. We don't go to the movies and say, go up a minute and a half, now back 30 seconds, now forward 45 seconds and piece it together to make it fit into English word order. That would be insane. But that's exactly what we're doing with Latin. But when you start to speak, and you make a genuine attempt to speak idiomatically, you are training your brain. You're training that part up there to process things in order. It's much more difficult than reading. It's the deadlifting, or the, the, the squatting, what swatting is to golf, speaking Latin is to Latin, to reading Latin. Right? You're building up these big core muscles. You're building up explosiveness and endurance so that you can read. I worked as a translator for three years, translating Swedish business texts 
into English. On a good day, if it was a text I had worked with before, 12 to 15 pages. That's a, that's a 10 to 12 hour work day. That's a lot. The guys who have done it for a long time, maybe they can get up to 20. 25 pages, they gotta take two days off after that. Talk to somebody who's a simultaneous translator at the UN, ask them how long they can translate. Not very long, they need to have big breaks. Translation is much more difficult than reading. It's not, it's not even close to the same thing. If you can read, I can plow through 40, 50, 60, 70 pages of Latin in a day and without hopping over anything in a, in a scientific text, right, where I've had to read myself in. Cicero is not a big deal. This is not, I'm not bragging. It's just reading. It's just reading. We can read. We read much better than we translate. So why should we waste time translating? And I would contend, in fact, that the only time you should start to translate is when you have mastered all of the idioms in the language. At that point, you can turn to your own language and play the game of moving from one idiom to another idiom. No Latinese. All right, I'm going to round off here. One minute. All right. Uh, think about skateboarders, universally hated by people who have benches out in front of their apartment buildings. <laughs> but look what they're doing. I would contend their pedagogy is better than ours. They run around, you know, if you've ever seen them, it's awesome. They run around filming each other, just like this, or with their cameras, and they'll have three or four things while they're jumping on something, breaking their necks, going down a handrail. Can you imagine balancing on a little board, going down a handrail at high speed, and then land? Or moving at a fast speed, jumping up, twisting a board in the air twice, and landing on it. If these teenagers can teach themselves to do that, can't we teach ourselves to speak Latin well? I think so. And we should have as much fun as they have doing it. It's perfectly possible. If we take this sports performance analysis and practice, rather than just keep reading. All right. Um, I'll round off here. So how, could, how should you organize your practice session? Let's say you, you think, OK, this, guy, this guy's got some crazy ideas. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to pretend I'm a golfer. Latin is, speaking Latin is the golf game. It's the performance aspect. How can I organize my practice sessions? I need to go to the driving range at least three times a week if I'm going to make practice. Use this approach. Analyze your game when you play. That is, pay attention when you speak to a good speaker. And if they're doing things that you can't do, make notes. If you're struggling with certain forms, certain idioms, take notes. And for when you go to your practice, then you spend 20% of your time, or you spend, let me put it this way, you spend half of your time on the 20% that you do really well, and you refine it. You extend it. You get even better and faster at that. That is, when you speak Latin, you're going to use about 20% of what you know to say about 80% of what you say. So work on what you're really good at. Extend it. Now, the 20%, and then, then look at the 20% of the stuff that you really, really struggle with, that you can hardly do at all. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's conditional clauses. Spend the other half of your time working on those on that 20% that you're really awful, that you think you're awful at. But don't think of it as being awful. Think of it as a continuum. And that when you practice, even if it's really elementary skills, you're going to start improving. You're going to refine those skills. You're going to move it up the continuum. And once you can move something from the lower 20% up to the 80%, well, take something else. But not before you've improved that. That is one thing at a time. Uh, what I have seen from some of the best Latin speakers in the world is, is that they take one thing at a time. If there's something that they're struggling with or something that a new friend says better than they do or they haven't heard that, they investigate it. They figure out exactly what they have to do. They start practicing. I mean, I know some of these people who put lists on the refrigerators. They don't tell people that, but they do. Uh, I mean, this is a transition. And then when you speak to them, they start using these new words on purpose. You all can do that. 
Organize your practice, and the last thing I'll say is this. So you've got your practice time split, 50%, 50%, right? Whatever you're gonna work on, develop three different drills so that you, work it, you approach it from three completely different directions. For instance, let's say I have issues with cum clauses with the uh, with, uh, pluperfect subjunctive, right? I'm a viset. Well, what's the best way to practice it? Cum clause and make a list of pluperfect subjunctives. Cum am amavisem, and see how fast you can say it. Do it for speed. Do it for length. That is, put 10 other words in there. Write something out so you've got a big space between the cum and the amavisem. Do it in different, do it first person, singular, plural. That is, three different ways. And you will see that if you take your time and practice consistently, you'll make progress. That's what athletics and sports pedagogy has to offer us as Latinists. Thank you, and we have got four minutes for questions. Yes? How do you motivate college students, though? Uh, it's tough. I, I try to show them the beauty of Latin. I try to show them the the great tradition. So we're sitting on a 2,200 year tradition. We have got loads of late medieval and early modern Latin. I'm interested in, my specialty is uh, scientific Latin, which I'm really interested in. I love it. I mean, I find that not only do I get to read it, but I learn something every day about astronomy, mathematics, natural history, uh, and, and medicine. So I think we should find out what the kids are interested in and get them reading and focus on building up their reading proficiency by speaking. And if they speak, they can have friends. Uh, before all of this started, it was tough to make friends in this profession because you really didn't have that much in common. You could sit around and talk about mythology or maybe Cicero, but you really didn't have that sort of dependent relationship that friendship really is. Uh, and I've made some wonderful friends and friendships which have really lasted. And with these people, most of the time I speak Latin. And it's an intimate relationship because you're so dependent on that person. And if he puts in time, my Latin's going to get better. Yes? I was interested in the distinction you made between reading and translating. Yes? As a teacher, I've, one appealing thing about translation is I can evaluate the students at it. Yeah. What does it look like when students are reading in the classroom and when their assignments are reading? Uh, then they, how do you structure a class around reading and not around translation? This is where composition and speaking is wonderful. If, you, if you're one of my students and I ask you to identify an ablative absolute and then I say, okay, good, that's the ablative absolute with the pro progressive imperfect participle. Do it with the perfect participle, all right? Or I uh, create I want you to create an ablative absolute which represents a, a doom clause. I want you to do one with a conditional C clause. I want you to do one with a temporal clause. That is, if they, when the students can reproduce accurately and consistently ablative absolutes, they understand them. Imagine if we had to read English and explain the grammar and syntax of everything we read. But instead, if I can speak English, and I can discuss a text with you, you know that I understand it. So that's what the speaking and writing is all about. We, we lift up the goal up here. If they can jump over that, they can do reading because reading is down here. We're, they're jumping 10 feet. And to read, you only got to jump three. So that's how you do it. Ask your students to do Abbot of Absolutes. Make them work on subordinating conjunctions. These are the big weaknesses for, for, for our students. For most of the students that I get at UMass Boston, some of them have gone to you know, Boston Latin, some great schools had four years of Latin, but when I start digging in and working them out like a coach with subordinate clauses, ablative absolutes, uh, in general how participles really work in Latin, they don't know anything about it, oftentimes. And once they do, their reading speeds pick up. Uh, Yes? Sorry, I just have a question about this. Um, yes? Students who have uh, I'm, I'm sorry. This is, uh, we can, we'll have to take this afterwards. The next, uh, we've got to round off. Uh, there's another speaker coming in. Thank you for your patience. Sorry we ran out of time. Um,